Hello and welcome everyone. Thank you so much for being here. My name is Kelly Morrison. I am a business system specialist in the New England Region Office of Portfolio Management. I will be the host and moderator of this morning's session. So today is day three of the PBS Customer Forum, Focus for the Future. First, I'd like to thank you for being here. Whether I'm welcoming you to your first session or you've been a regular attendee for all three days with ongoing attendance, we're so happy you're here and grateful for your time and participation. We have two important sessions prepared for our customers today. In just a few minutes, I'm going to turn the mic over to a panel of PBS subject matter experts who are going to discuss digital project management tools. And later this morning, our closing session will be led by Andrea O'Neill, a session on building diversity, infusing DEIA principles into public projects. So before we begin the session, I would like to highlight a few housekeeping notes. This session is being recorded. We intend to publish the forum recordings and the slide presentations to the GSA website. That link will be included in the chat pod below so you can bookmark, bookmark that forum page and reference the sessions from this year's customer forum. And if you haven't already, you can like X out of the pop-up window announcing the recording of this session. Please note that the attendee audio has been automatically muted for this session to control the sound quality of the presentation. Your cameras are inactive as well, so you don't have to worry about us seeing you. And closed captioning for this event is available. You can um, open that one of two ways. First, um, in window Zoom captioning, can be found by clicking on the more button on your Zoom panel and view subtitles, or you can click the link below in the chat pod and view open a companion window to watch side-by-side -side captioning with your Zoom screen. And please note, this is a FedRAMP compliant Zoom for government platform. You can customize your experience with the different pods as you wish. And then if you'd like to adjust your view or layout, you can do so by in the upper right hand corner, the view option allows you to customize your layout. So today we will be relying on two different Zoom pods, the chat and the Q&A. Please use chat specifically for any administrative questions or to report any technical issues and one of our forum members can assist you. And this session is geared to our clients, our customers, your participation is encouraged throughout. And we ask that you use the Q&A pod to um, add your questions or comments. And I will direct those questions to our presenters during designated Q&A breaks. And with that, it is time to begin today's program. This first session is led by a panel of PBS subject matter experts. They will provide a quick guided tour of several tools, both new and forthcoming technology to manage your portfolio of PBS projects. So I will kick off our seven presenter bios and then pass the mic over to our first team. So to begin, we have Ashley Carlson and Rachel Bixel. Ashley is the National Program Manager for Reimbursable Services. Her team is responsible for providing training and resources to customers, as well as creating, maintaining, updating, and operationalizing the RWA policies that govern the program. Her team also manages the RITA and eRITA software applications that house RWA data and documentation. Ashley works at GSA headquarters in Washington, DC, and has been with the agency for over 18 years. Rachel Bixel is the Great Lakes Region RWA Program Manager in the Design and Construction Division. Rachel joined GSA in 2007. She has been in her current role since 2015, serving as the Regional RWA Manager, Schedule Advocate, and GPM SME. Rachel supports Region 5's project management community through the oversight, creation, and implementation of project management-related business processes, tools, and training. So both Rachel and Ashley will kick off our first session for RWAs and eRITA. Following that presentation, we'll hear from Tina Atkins and Valerie Pierre on Kahua. Tina Atkins is the Program Manager in the Office of Design and Construction. She leads the change management and communication efforts for Kahua, PBS's new project management and collaboration tool. Tina has 25 years of experience with GSA, 15 of those working for Region 6 in client solutions and workforce development, and 10 years working for GSA's central office on national project management initiatives. 
Next, we have Valerie Pierre. Valerie is a project information system coordinator in the Office of Design and Construction. She leads the portfolio and training support teams for Kahua. Prior to working on the Kahua program, she supported multiple information systems and provided program management services for GSA, both as a federal employee and a contractor. Then our third presentation will be given by Lisa McCoy and Deanne Salazar with an overview of the OASIS tool. Lisa McCoy is a member of the National Rent Billing Office and is a business line lead to develop an OA tool replacement. Lisa has been with GSA for 28 years working in both Region 4, Atlanta, and Central Office. Her previous experience ranges from the Consolidation Program, Historic Preservation, Art in Architecture, and Regional Data Management, to serving as a Special Assistant for two Regional Assistant Commissioners. Deanne Salazar works in the National Rent Billing Office on Customer Billing and GSA Policy. Deanne has been with GSA for 21 years, beginning in Region 6, Kansas City, before moving to Central Office 16 years ago. And last, but certainly not least, we will hear from Andrea Bell with an overview of Project Pulse Surveys and our Client Enrichment Series offerings. Andrea is a National Program Manager of Customer Intelligence with the Office of Portfolio Management and Customer Engagement. Andrea is responsible for several program areas, including our Project Pulse Survey and our monthly educational program, the Client Enrichment Series. In her role, she helps to share information about PBS services and solutions with clients and works across PBS regions and business lines to help share customer feedback and intelligence with PBS staff. So after that exhaustive note and a lot of commentary by me, I would like to welcome and personally thank our panelists for being here today. I will be moderating the Q&A sessions between presenters, so please feel free to submit those questions. We welcome your active participation. And with that, I will hand the mic over to Ashley and Rachel of the eRita team. Thank you and welcome. Great, thanks Kelly, appreciate the intros. Um, I have to update my bio. Today's 19 years for me with GSA, so it's my anniversary. But that said, nothing better than to chat with our customers about some of the awesome tools and programs that we have. So the RWA program is something that has been around for a long time. It's evolved, it's continued to um, change, which is awesome, but it's kind of one of the pillars for customers when they wanna do interactions in business with GSA. So generally, most of you are probably saying, hmm, what is an RWA? Or gosh, Ashley, we've heard you and your colleagues many times over talk about RWAs. So getting back to general basics, just for those new to the party, an RWA is used for basically anything above your standard rent. So if you want to do work within your building, you have your space. Let's say right now your, um, your folks are coming into the office possibly differently. Your space layouts need to look a little bit different. Well, you would come to GSA still, right, to work through that and figure it out. And we would do the transaction through a reimbursable work authorization. That's what RWA stands for. So it's all those above standard projects and then services if you need folks to come in on, let's say, Saturdays um, for different initiatives and missions that you have, or perhaps your agency is more of a 24-hour agency. We, of course, have those as well, right? So the RWA is that piece that kind of connects things, and it has a lot behind it. It sounds very simple to say, let's fill out a form and have a business transaction, but there's a lot more behind it. Hence, we have this awesome program with a lot of great folks that support it across the country. And from a project management perspective, I'd say that's where the program has evolved the most to take it from it being very financially driven and connecting it to our project management part and our building managers and property managers. So we really have this cohesive network for you where you as a customer come to GSA and say, I have this need. Some of you might say, I know exactly what it is. I've got great scope and scope of work figured out, excuse me. I already know a general estimate for it. And I just need to talk to my GSA counterpart so I can get the ball rolling. Others might come and say, gosh, I don't really know. I, I've been in my space. I feel like we need to make some new configurations because our agency is downsizing the space that we need. Um, or we just need to do some different open office space, right? That's another concept that's changed over the years. And we want you to be able to adapt and be nimble within your space. And that's what we're here for. The tough part is it's not as simple as I have a need, you give us money and we do it. We have to obviously follow a process and a policy. The policy that we have is our RWA National Policy Manual. 
there's links on these slides when you guys receive them. I know some of you already have them. You can check them out, but it takes you to our external website. We have a policy and process page. We also have an e-reader page. There's a couple there. I encourage you to visit the page for more information. Um, anytime you have questions, that's a great first step on where to go and who to talk to. Anyhow, the policy is a very lengthy document and it's the how behind our program. Excuse me, the what behind our program, I'm so sorry. It generally talks through where um, appropriations law meets things within where GSA also takes particular concern of how things work. We should be the experts on it. You guys are not expected to read our policy and be the experts. So when you have questions and when you're working through this process, this super simple RWA process that we're gonna show you and unpack that it might not seem as simple as it is, but I promise you it is actually rather straightforward. We're the ones that'll help you navigate it. So the policy governs kind of where we are and what we're doing. And like I said, the appropriations law draws a big part in it as well as just general expectations that are set between us. Um, the process that we have outlined, I'm going to get through on the next slide, but just kind of an intro of the policy and process work together. It's the what and the how. Do you need to know behind the curtain? Absolutely not, but transparency, right? It's great for you guys to have that open door attitude and be able to know exactly what we're doing. So we will share some of those elements with you and it hopefully makes for a better customer experience. E-Rita is our transparency tool is what we are tagging it here. It's truly your external version into the same application that we use. Um, Rachel, my colleague, will get into more details on that when we get in there in a few minutes. But it, generally speaking, our policy drives what we do. Our e-Rita is our tool to do it. So they work together. And as you'll see in this entire presentation, we work with our colleagues across PBS to have a seamless process for project management. Can we go to the next slide, please? So the policy and process is where I'm going to have the conversation and then I'll turn it over to Rachel. As I said, it sounds kind of complicated, even looking at this pretty crazy chart that you see on the right hand side of your screen. It's really not. It's intended to really unpack and take something that's complex and break it down for you so you know kind of where you are in it. And if you want more information, because again, this is a conversation we're having with you to show you all of the tools and kind of how things work together. We do have some policy and process training planned for next month on July 21st, where we'll get into the weeds behind our policy manual that's that 150-page document of just in-depth information of how the RWA program works and what governs what we can and cannot do. Um, but the thing I wanted to focus most upon in this is the work request to RWA process. So can't ask you because we're not in a room to interactively ask, but in your heads, be knowing your answer to, do you know if a work request and an RWA are the same thing? So in your head, hopefully you said, no, Ashley, they're two different things. The work request is what starts the process. The RWA is what it is once it's passed across with funding and it's been committed and ready to be obligated. So why does that matter? It matters because when we started evolving the RWA program and really using eRita as more of a, a management tool of the entire process, we were able to identify, we can't call everything an RWA. An RWA is when it's actually got that funding on it and it's sent forward to GSA. So if you focus your attention on the chart on the right-hand side, the piece of the puzzle I'd like you to understand and focus upon is that top box, that work request to RWA process starting box, okay? The pre-planning status. So we encourage you to go into the system and enter your information. Again, think back to the examples I have, the customer that knows exactly what they want and what they anticipate it'll cost versus the customer that says, I'm not really sure. That's what I'm coming to GSA for. You guys are the experts. Either way, it doesn't matter. You're going to go in and create a work request, whether it's a project or a service. You're going to go in the system, create that work request. Here's the cool part. You can save it and not send it to us. You can have a draft email, basically, right? How many times do you go in? to your email and start an email and save it as draft because you say, I'm not ready to send it, right? Or I need to make a couple tweaks. You can do that here. That's that pre-planning status. Anything you guys have in there that you've saved and not sent forward to us, that's fine. It's just an idea. So we encourage you to use the tool from that perspective. Moving forward to our unassigned status, that's after you click the button. You've put in the six pieces of information we need to know, super basics. And we get you a PM and start working on it with you to say, what do you really need? Or I see that you have a very detailed scope already. Let's talk through. Here's some things that I think maybe you missed or we need to talk about, or here's some other alternatives. 
And that's what our project management community helps with, right? The cool thing about this whole red box at the top and the next box in the middle is this is what you've been doing with GSA for years outside of systems. It's been happening with emails. It's been happening with conversations. And this just captures it all in a very transparent way for both sides because people move and shift in careers and jobs and convocation. They do all these things and the work still has to go on. So this is a way of having that. And rather than going through kind of every single step in the whole process, Touching on the next block, that's where we're going to do our requirements development. We're going to work with you, have some back and forth. That time frame is the biggest thing that people say, well, how long does that take? It depends. It depends on the complexity of how, what you're asking us for. It depends how many variables you already had answers to. It depends on our own resources internally, right? If 15 customers come to us with 25 needs all on the same day, I would say it will probably take us a little bit, right? Versus if we only have two come in, not as tough. So workload obviously plays a part in it as well. You finish that stage, that's when your work request moves into being an RWA. Again, this is all in the system. You've entered everything. And as soon as you put your financial information in, it sends it across the fence, if you will, to GSA. And we begin the review process. And the very last piece of the whole thing is digital signatures. That's the part that I think folks struggle with as well as timing of signatures. We capture dig digital signatures at the very end. Again, if we were in the room and I could see all of your faces and you couldn't just see mine, I'd say, how many of you have had to revise an RWA after your folks had already signed it in the old paper method? I'm gonna guess at least 50% of you have your hands up, meaning came through to GSA after you had signed it and we said, oh gosh, this is wrong or this needs tweaked or corrected. And you had to go back to your management or senior management or heaven forbid, huge high up people to ask them to re-sign something and explain, oops, we had a typo or our TAS was wrong or something silly like that, right? So this improves that process. So the whole process continues. It's within our system, which is a cool thing. And our policy is mixed in there so that it's kind of the backbone of everything. And I'm gonna let Rachel jump into some more Erita stuff. I'm sure I spoke a lot of the things she probably had on her mind, um, but just kind of more about our tool besides just this process element. Can we slip to the next slide, please? All right, thanks, Ashley. So eReta has really improved our process overall. So we've increased the data accuracy and availability of data. So when you enter information into the system, almost all of the fields in eReta check your info as you enter it. And there's a little search function. So if you don't even know what your information is, you can actually do a drill down search where you would click a little magnifying glass and drill down into that information by entering some limited information. So our data accuracy has improved drastically. So as Ashley mentioned, we used to receive RWAs on paper with some information, maybe some of it wasn't filled out, maybe some of it was just wrong. And it took a lot of manual effort to validate that and then go back and forth to correct it. This has increased our data accuracy by enabling you to get it right the first time and you get to do it easier. You don't have to go hunt around and find the right person to talk to. You can actually just search it in the system. Also, as we said, it's providing transparency. So that financial activity is available for you to view and you can see what's been spent against the RWA, what remains, and it's updated against our financial system, which is called Pegasus, if anybody's ever heard of it, you don't need to know that, but it's updated against our financial system four times a day. So it is fairly accurate uh, four times a day, which should be more than enough for most RWA projects. It's also documenting all the activity that happens. So we get a lot of questions about, has this been closed? Has this been accepted? Has, um, has the estimate been linked? And you can actually see all of that now in the documentation audit tool of eReta. So anytime you open up an RWA in the eReta system, uh, there's little links at the bottom that are yellow. So if you're colorblind, apologies, but they are at the bottom and they're yellow. And uh, it's got a documentation audit section where you can go and you can view all of the documents that have been uploaded and linked, and you can even upload your own. So if you have any specifics that you would like to include, you can put that in the official RWA file. And then this has also sped up the RWA acceptance process overall. I know it may not seem like the 
process has shortened because the work request part is now in there. But if you were to include all of the work that happened via email, all the way up to the RWA acceptance, we have shrunk that time frame drastically. And then the actual part from when you send your RWA in until when we accept it or route it for signature really has shrunk from about three months to less than three weeks. So we commit to doing that within 15 business days. So there is e-reta training. I talked about some of the specifics in the system, but obviously you can't see it. We give live e-reta training about three or four times a year. Uh, the last one was just in the beginning of May. The next one will be offered again in 2023. And those trainings are recorded and they're available at our website, gsa.gov slash e-reta. And there are also lots of good guides there. So if you don't want to sit through a video of me or someone else talking, you can uh, go to the guide, which is nice. It has screenshots of each section. So you can scroll through and just see what you're supposed to be looking at at that moment. So those guides are, are pretty good. Um, we're going to make them even better soon. So looking forward to that. I think that wraps up what we wanted to discuss. And so at this point, we're gonna open it up for questions. Okay, um, we are not seeing any questions from the audience in the pod right now. Oh, nope, we do have one. Monica Lopez asks, when should we submit FY23 recurring renewals. FY23 RWAs need to be submitted in FY23 for uh, if you're using FY23 funding. So the work request can be submitted now. You can submit that as soon as possible. We've already put together estimates for most of the recurring services for FY23, they're under review right now, and those are going to be approved and routed to you for your review to link to a work request. But I would encourage you to put the uh, work request into eReta as soon as you know you need that service. Uh, as, and there was a question, work request means just save or submit, and we mean submit it. Submit it to us, we can assign a resource and get the estimate linked to it. Thank you, Monica. That question came in from the IRS. That's great. Um, I think we will go on to our next section, but if you have any questions throughout the duration of this presentation within the hour, we can time permitting, we can follow up with any questions that come through the chat. Thank you both Ashley and Rachel for your time and for your participation. And with that, we will pass the mic over to Tina Atkins and Valerie Pierre to discuss Kahua. Thank you both. Great, thank you. It's great to be back. Um, last year, Valerie and I attended the customer forum and we shared with you a preview of Kahua. I believe last year we were right in the middle of configuring the tool and we promised at that time that we'd be back to share with you more information on Kahua and um, its deployment and how to get access to the tool. So here we are. And as we mentioned, um, or as was mentioned, Kahua is the Public Building Services new project management information system, an acronym language that's a PMIS. Um, if you're not familiar with the PMIS, it is a software tool that allows project teams to collaborate on project issues, financials, scheduling, design reviews, construction reviews, and a place to manage and store your project documents. You also may be wondering what kind of name is Kahua? Um, a lot of people have tried to say it and, and we've heard the gamut. So um, Kahua is a Hawaiian name and it means foundation or platform. We find that um, its meaning is appropriate for us because Kahua is going to set the foundation for project delivery excellence. Today, our learning objectives are for you to obtain an understanding of what Kahua can do in regard to project management and collaboration. There will be several people working in Kahua for various purposes, so we'll cover who's going to be in the tool. We'll also go over what the customers, you, um, 
can do in Kahua and you, when, we, when you will get access to the tool. And since that time is getting really close, um, we will go over the steps for accessing Kahua. Then we're gonna share with you some links for where you can go for more information or if you need assistance. And then we'll close it out by opening it up for more questions. So now I'm gonna turn it over to Valerie and she's gonna get us started. Thank you, Tina. Good morning, everybody. Uh, so Kahoo is replacing the Electronic Project Management Tool or EPM, which will be decommissioned in the next month. So there are a few reasons why we're moving away from EPM. So first, EPM will no longer be supported by its vendor. In 2016, Trimble, the EPM vendor, notified us that they were going to start limiting support for ProLiance, which is the EPM platform. So that sped up the need to move away from EPM, which was already a consideration due to feedback we had received from the user community. Second, EPM never, never really met our expectations. We needed a tool that allowed us to collaborate with our, our pro, on our projects throughout the project lifecycle. And EPM was really used as a tool to just populate information for, report, for reporting purposes. Third, Navigating EPM wasn't really that easy. And because there are no integrations with other tools, users had to enter information in other systems and then re-enter it into EPM. So we had the opportunity to give our users a better project management tool that integrates with other systems and allows for stakeholder collaboration. So now that I've given you some background on why we're using Kahua, let's take a look at some of the benefits. So first, Kahua is not only a tool for project managers. All business lines will have a role to play in the system, whether it's a leasing team member managing a new lease, a building manager, or a planning manager who creates client project agreements. Because of this expansion to other business lines, Kahua includes more project types. Um, so we have lease acquisition, new construction, repair and alteration. Um, all those project types will use, uh, will use Kahua. And starting in the next few months, we'll have projects that are managed by agencies and delegated space. Uh, we'll have those in Kahua as well. Kahua will capture all project phases. So in EPM, it was pretty common for projects to be created once they received funding rather than at project intake. So as a result, there was no centralized location to find all of the data and documents that told the project history before the project was funded. So with Kahua, we want to make sure that all project data and records are created in Kahua as soon as the projects originate. Um, that way you can use the, the tool to upload studies, manage your milestones and estimates before the project even receives funding. And creating projects at intake will also help promote early project planning in the system. So the different project types all have unique challenges and business processes. And we need to make sure that Kahua can work with, uh, can support each of them equally. So for example, if we have a $20,000 painting project that shouldn't require the same, using the same apps in Kahua as a large, let's say new construction courthouse. So we worked with the cross regional team to carefully craft usage requirements and matrices for different project types. And Kahoo will foster project collaboration. So as I mentioned before, it's not just a tool for project managers. All team members, including contractors and clients, are able to collaborate in Kahua. And in a few slides, I'll talk about what customers can actually do in Kahua. All right, on the, what will Kahua do? So let's take a look at what makes Kahua a great tool to use. So we'll start with access. So Kahua has a single interface. So there's one site where you log in to access all your project types, whether they're above prospectus, below prospectus, or lease projects. So previously in the old system in EPM, you would go to EPM for above prospectus projects. And then a lot of people, if they were managing below, pre below prospectus projects, they went to EPM Express. So with Kahua, it's one site for everyone, regardless of your project type. Kahua loads faster than EPM, um, which is really important for users who are managing a large number of projects. With EPM, you sometimes ran into issues navigating from one project to another or saving a project on one, uh, one tab of the project and then going to the next. Kahua is a lot more uh, quick when it comes to navigating throughout the site. 
Kahua has mobile capabilities that can be used on Apple and Android devices. That way the tool can be used by stakeholders when you're um, on the project site, you won't have to worry about remembering something and having to go back to your desk and enter that information. You can look it up all while you're on site. And ex use internal and external. So like I mentioned, Kahoo is used by internal GSA users and external users, including customers and contractors. Uh, next sticky note. Kahoo is easy to use and to navigate. Like I mentioned before, the interface is really intuitive and you can easily find the apps that you need to use. And it doesn't take too many clicks to move around the tool. Um, on the data integration side, uh, we're looking forward to finalizing all of our data integrations with GSA applications. And what this will do is it'll cut down on the amount of duplicate data entry um, that users have to do in, across different systems. Uh, on dashboards, Kahua features robust built-in reports and dashboards. So for example, you have project fact sheets that show things like milestones or uh, team members and description of the project. We have schedule reports that show milestones with estimated and actual dates on them. And additionally, Kahua has dashboards that feature predefined or user-defined what we call widgets um, that allow users to see at a glance things like the number of project submittals on a, uh, on a project or the number of open design review comments. Um, so that makes it really easy just to see information at a glance when you're looking either at a project or a set of projects. Next sticky. Uh, so we're looking at forward to many uh, integrations that I mentioned before that will allow us to easily find and store documents. So first one is EDMS and CFR. So integrations with EDMS, which is GSA's Enterprise Document Management System, and CFR, the Central File Repository, will give us standardized processes to retrieve and archive building documents such as drawings, specifications, equipment inventories, and operations manuals. With Google Drive integration, users will be able to store and link Google Drive uh, documents to projects in Kahua. The BIM markup tool, um, Kahua features a built-in BIM viewer, which will make it so that all project team members can view models without needing to install separate software to read those models. And lastly, integration with email. So future integration with Gmail will allow users to send emails directly from Kahua. And on the next slide, our next sticky for collaboration, Kahoo will give us many opportunities for collaboration with GSA and with our external users. So first up, RFIs, requests for information. So Kahoo's RFI functionality lets the general contractor or GSA personnel users quickly initiate RFIs and route them to customers or to responders for review. Um, so the tool also keeps a log of all RFIs and has easy to use workflows that help project teams manage responses. Submittals can also be quickly created in Kahua and routed for approval. So you can also produce a, a submittal log that shows the status, reviewer names, and due dates. So it's really easy to keep organized within Kahua. Design review is a big one. So this will be vastly improved in Kahua. Right now, a lot of project teams uh, that have been using EPM opted to conduct design reviews outside of, of, of EPM. Um, they do it either in Google Sheets or Excel, and that's because EPM's design review functionality was not easy to use. This functionality has been vastly improved in Kahua, so we look forward to having a lot of project teams start to use this functionality. Um, on the scheduling side, smaller projects can just use the Milestones app or application within uh, Kahua. And all they need to do is just enter milestone dates, such as notice to proceed or substantial completion. And on larger projects, they can import schedules from Microsoft Project directly into Kahua and have those milestones populated in the Milestones app. And lastly, punch lists. Uh, Kahua's punch list functionality can be accessed via a mobile device, like I mentioned before, uh, which is convenient for users that are in the field. All right, next slide. 
Right. I mentioned before that Kahoot is not only a team, a project uh, manager's tool. It can be used for um, anyone across the project team. So it's not just a, a system for a project manager to update your status, update your schedule, and then come back the next month. All collaboration can be done in Kahua versus over email or offline spreadsheets. So on the left side of the screen, you can see some of the GSA stakeholders who use Kahua. So that includes a project a planning manager who creates client project agreements, a subject matter expert reviewing drawings, a building manager who's looking for a project schedule. Uh, we also have contracting officers who are looking at invoices. And then lastly, we may have asset managers who are looking at projects that take place in a specific building. On the right-hand side, you can see some of our, our network of external users. So that includes customers, general contractors, architects, engineers, and construction managers. The entire project team can use Kahua as a collaboration tool. Next slide. All right, so how will customers use Kahua? So Kahua provides a lot of information on projects via its applications or apps. So through the apps, you can do things like review documents and provide comments. You can collaborate with project teams on drawings and markups um, using the design review app. You can view daily reports, field observations, submittals, punch lists, and RFIs. Those are all standalone apps within Kahua. You can view reports that I mentioned, like fact sheets. You can download project details. So if you wanted to look at um, the project description, the location, the scope of the project, you know, how many people are in the building, how many parking spaces, square footage, you can get that information. And a lot of this functionality, like I mentioned, is accessible on Apple or Android mobile devices. Uh, next slide. All right, so when will Kahua be available for customers? So on this slide, you're seeing where we've been deployment wise over the past nine months. So Kahua is being deployed in phases. Um, so the phased approach gives us the opportunity to roll out the tool um, by project type in region um, versus doing everything at once, rolling it out to, to all regions and all users and all project types. Um, so a phase rollout also allows us to take lessons learned from one phase and incorporate them into future phases. So in October, uh, we started phase one, which was deployment to select lead projects. So this started out as a list of about 40 projects um, and rapidly expanded as people were curious about Kahua and wanted to test drive the functionality for their actual projects. So in the end, I think grew up to about 200 projects for this phase. So with this group, we wanted to make sure that the tool and workflows were configured properly, that our training materials were accurate and helpful to users, and that our support system was set up. So this was we wanted to take care of all of this before we rolled out to a larger group of users. And along the way, we asked this phase one group for feedback as they used the tool to find out what worked well in Kahua and what they thought should be modified. Then we rolled into phase two. So phase two was our deployment to above prospectus owned and above prospectus lease acquisition projects. And we completed this phase in April. Uh, right now we're in, the, we're in uh, phase three and we're close to wrapping up that phase. Uh, this is our phase for owned below prospectus and post occupancy lease alteration projects. Phase four will, this, will begin next month. Um, in this phase, we'll be deploying to um, project teams who manage lease acquisition below prospectus projects. We'll also have projects managed by agencies in delegated spaces and to customers. So for this audience, the timeline for customers is um, on August 1st, we'll begin licensing users. On August 18th, we'll provide instructor-led training as part of the client enrichment series. Um, this first training on August 18th will be a good first look at Kahua where we'll teach users how to log in, discuss navigation, and how to find project information. On September 15th, we'll dive a little bit deeper into Kahua and look at um, uh, some more functionality within the app. So this will also be instructor-led training, but we'll go um, into some more of the apps and teach users things like how to create documents, 
and show things like the design review functionality. If you're unable to attend either of the trainings, we will record the sessions and make the uh, videos available on our gsa.gov site, which Tina is going to cover in a few minutes. So right now I'll turn it back over to Tina, who's going to talk about how customers can get access to Kahua. Great, thanks Val. As Val pointed out, for the customers who wish to access Kahua, we will be sending an email around August 1st with the following instructions. So first, you're gonna to want to reach out to your GSA project manager. Um, you can actually start doing that now um, to let them know that you want access to Kahua and they'll get your name on the list. We'll also, um, uh, for those that actually have EPM accounts, we'll be um, sharing that list with our EPM, uh, I'm sorry, with our project managers. So in our regional point of contacts, um, however, we do wanna encourage you to still reach out to your GSA project manager, just to be sure that your name is on the list. So you're gonna receive an email around August 1st uh, to finalize your account. The email will come from outbox at kahuafn.com with the subject line, Kahua Invitation. So keep an eye on that email. It's kind of different. Um, it can be easily overlooked. Sometimes it gets into the spam file um, or folder. Um, so keep an eye out for it. Um, it'll again have that subject line, Kahua invitation. It's gonna have the instructions for you to, um, to finalize your account. You're gonna need to finalize your account in order to get access to Kahua. So on the next slide, um, the third step is um, once you've finalized your account, you'll want to access Kahua. You have three options for doing this. You can use the desktop app, you can use a web browser, or you can use a mobile device. To use the desktop app, you're gonna to need to download the Kahua app to your computer. Your computer will need to have Windows 8.1 or higher. Um, the desktop app is recommended as it will provide a more stable platform versus using the internet. So anything that's downloaded to your computer is usually more stable than, than working off the internet. So, um, but that does, but the web, um, the web browser version is also a good option as well. Um, is if you prefer not to download the software or if your agency precludes you from downloading um, the software, you can also access Kahua using the web browser. Um, you'll need to use Chrome, Edge, Firefox, or Safari. You'll enter um, the, the following URL into the browser, launch.kahuafn.com. And then when that screen comes up, you'll click on launch in browser, and that will start the sign-in process into Kahua. So whether you use the desktop app or the browser, you're gonna to wanna to, um, bookmark the URL that launch.kahuafn.com and use that URL at least once a week to log into Kahua. That will ensure that any new updates that have been made to Kahua, they usually do that over the weekend. So Monday's a good day to do it. Um, but if you log in using that URL, make sure that you have all those new updates. When you download the desktop app to your computer, you're gonna get a, a little, Kahua Snowflake emblem on your desktop, you can use that to actually access Kahua as well, um, but you're gonna to wanna to use that URL at least once a week so you get those updates. All right, I'm gonna show you um, what the login um, screen looks like here on the next slide, but um, before we go there, I wanna cover the third option for access, accessing Kahua. And as Val mentioned, we have um, the ability to use Kahua on a mobile device. So the device must be government or contractor issued um, device um, or phone. So you'll go to the App Store if you're using an iPhone or the Google Play Store if you're using an Android and search for Kahua. Um, you'll select Kahua Mobile Construction Management if you're on an iPhone and then Kahua Mobile Kahua Business if you are on an Android. And then for either one of them, you'll hit either get or install whichever device you're on in order to install the app on your phone. All right, on that next slide um, is the screenshot of launchkahuafn.com. So the next slide, there we go. Um, if you have the app downloaded to your computer, you'll get a pop-up window um, that'll, that you'll just wanna click on open Kahua to start the sign-in process. And if you have the app downloaded um, and that pop-up doesn't, come up, um, there's another option there at the bottom says open now, you'll click on that to start the process. 
Um, if you um, want to just use the, the web browser, if you don't have the desktop app loaded, it's, you won't see that pop up. You'll just need to click on launch to browser. So that's circled there in the middle of the screen. Um, if you want to use the web version. All right. So on this last slide, um, it includes where to go for information or assistance. So as an end user, um, you can access our online resources. We have a site on gsa.gov called the Project Management Information System. And this site includes access and training information. It includes the steps I just took you through for accessing Kahua. It also includes a library of short videos and quick reference guides for using almost all of the applications in Kahua. If you prefer an instructor-led course, um, the training calendar is also posted on the site with registration information. And as Val mentioned, there will be two instructor-led courses for customers only, um, scheduled for August 18th and September 15th. And you're gonna receive an email about those two courses and how to register for them um, in the near future. Um, they'll also be included on that training calendar that's also posted on the gsa.gov site. So also when working in Kahua, the videos are also available to you by right-clicking on an application name in the left-hand menu and selecting the video in the pop-up window. So when you're in the tool and you click on the apps, um, that'll start to show up on the left-hand menu of Kahua. When you see them there, you can right-click there and it'll come up with a pop-up window. And one of those options there is to, to view a video on that application. So that's just another quick way of of finding information um, on Kahua and how to use a particular application. All right, if you need immediate assistance, um, you can fill out a short form using the Kahua support and feedback form. If you're unable to access the form, you can email Kahua support at gsa.gov. Either one will prompt you um, and someone will prompt someone to, to get back with you and help you out. All right, so with that, I'm gonna open it up um, for questions. Valerie and I also have with us Nick Jacali. He's our product owner for Kahua to assist, assist us with answering any of your questions. So does anyone Thanks have- so much, both Tina and Valerie. Actually, in the interest of time with 10 minutes remaining and two more subjects, we're going to move on to the next subject of Oasis, but um, we do encourage um, our customers to respond directly within the Q&A pod and we can respond um, by typing an answer, or if we have time at the end, we will address um, all of the questions. So with that, we will go to Lisa McCoy and Deanne Salazar for an update on this Oasis OA tool replacement. Thank you. And you've heard um, about two of our systems that are already existing, and Oasis is kind of our coming attractions. We're very excited about what we're going to be able to do with it. So how will Oasis benefit you? you're gonna have a new customer self-service area related to your rent and occupancy agreements. So you'll be able to look at your OAs by your AB code. You'll be able to take two different versions of OAs and compare them side by side visually. Um, you'll be able to get your rent data whenever you'd like it and your assignment drawings whenever you'd like it. And um, two things that we heard from you that we added um, as a response to your feedback was to be able to put the head counts in there yourself so that you don't have to have a data call. And three open fields. We heard from a lot of folks that you have internal um, either numbering or notes or something that you want to be able to sort reports by. And if you can't add that to the OA, you can't do that. So we're giving you three open fields. You can use it for anything that you want. We'll never touch it. We'll never do anything with it. So you can do notes, you can do your region, your region for your agency, whatever works for you and anything that goes in there will be in the system. So all of your reporting can be sorted based upon um, those pieces of information. So we're excited about being able to do that. Um, Oasis will become the sole place to do several things. And we're doing this because we also heard from you that we're inundated with OAs. We can't tell which ones are more important to sign, what's priority. So now we're going to have a completely electronic, trackable, searchable, reportable system. So you will be receiving OAs um, through Oasis. So you will need to be an Oasis user. Um, and then you can review them. You can compare them to previous versions and you can approve them in the system to send them back to GSA. 
Now, there are lots of things about that um, that we're going to talk about in just a minute uh, to give you some information. But the main thing we want to get across is that this is the new way <clears throat> that OEs are going to be handled in the future. Um, and that's going to benefit, I think, both of us, but there is going to be a learning curve. Um, this will also be a way to avoid the manual and email submission of your request to release space and start your pricing right um, to do that. This will be in OASIS as well. So you'll be able to do reporting and tracking on how many have I submitted? What was the estimated date? Is it still there? You know, what was my square footage? All of that will be available to you now because it'll be electronically in the OASIS system. And if we can go to the next slide. So you may have seen an announcement letter that we sent in January, and that kind of outlines some of the changes that we're putting in place now to get ready for OASIS. That letter said we expected to have the system up in October. Um, we are connected to a lot of systems, so we are finding it a little more difficult than we had hoped to do that internal integration. So our go live date is now April 3rd of 2023. So we've got some time um, to get everything ready and to make sure that you're fully um, ready to move into this new system. And as part of that, um, we are sending, we have sent a follow-up letter to the same folks who got the January letter, letting them know that our go live date has changed and how to get additional information. Um, but we're also going to be sending a letter later in June specifically to your CFOs. So in order to talk about all the intricacies of how this new system is going to work and how that may impact your internal process, we're going to ask the CFOs to either identify um, POCs, points of contact for their AB code, or to make sure that someone else in your organization does, because we want to have those points of contact to have you know, real conversations, really get into the nitty gritty with people that are going to be involved in this process so that we can answer all of your questions, make sure that everything's clear to everyone. And we can also give advice about how this may impact your internal system, depending on how you do approvals today. So we're, we're gonna be looking for that um, coming out near the end of June. And then we will set up individual meetings um, with the points of contact so that we can work directly with them um, as a group individually <laughs> with us. Um, and if there are any follow-ups, we will meet with them at, again as well. So uh, POC, POC for more than one AB code, some of you will have that and that's fine. We just wanna make sure that there's at least one point of contact for every AB code. Um, in January and February of next calendar year, that's when you're gonna see the training and we'll have resources and guides and helpful information um, for you to help you go through that initial learning curve. And if you'll go to the next slide, please. So this is where you can get additional information. We have a website on gsa.gov. You can also email us at this um, email address. And we also have a link here for a client enrichment series that we did in April 5th was specifically about OASIS. So this has all the information about who needs to be a user on your side, how the OA timing is gonna work, how this is gonna be different than our current system and how it's going to drastically reduce the volume of OAs that you need to review. So all of that's in there. And we're having another session um, September 8th that will be, again, specifically about OASIS. So that's where we can kind of get a little bit deeper um, into the system and explain more and be able to answer your questions directly. So thank you very much. If there are any questions now, I will address them. Thank you so much, Lisa. We have been having um, a bit of activity in the Q&A pod, so please feel free to go through, send your questions while we continue the presentation. And you can see that our panelists are answering some of those live by typing responses in the interim. And for right now, we will ask Andrea, um, excuse me, Andrea Bell to give us a little update on Project Pulse Surveys and the Client Enrichment Series. All right, thank you, Kelly. Um, I'm lucky to appear alongside these lovely folks today who are talking a lot about the tools that support our project management operations uh, so that they are now available to you and to your GSA project management team. But one thing we wanted to really focus on, of course, is that it's improving um, the transparency, ease of doing business, and in general, your experience mm -hmm. with our project management efforts. 
So if you are an RWA or lease point of contact for your project, for your agency, you're probably already receiving what we call our Project Pulse surveys. Uh, they go out every month when your RWA or lease projects reach certain cr critical key milestones, which may happen at the beginning of their project life cycle as early as, say, lease request for proposal or RWA acceptance, and then right on through your uh, project's life cycle down to substantial completion or when your lease finally becomes effective. So um, they're designed to be short surveys, little pulses at different points within that process, just to see if we're uh, providing you the services uh, at the level of service that you would you would hope to, uh, to receive and, and expect from our from our staff. So the questions uh, we really revolve around scope, schedule, and budget. Of course, those are really three pillars of project management. But we also get into areas about communications and about uh, kind of the ongoing relationship that you have with your project management team. And our survey uh, has a field where we encourage you to provide specific written comments. Um, I see all of the responses to the surveys. I review them every month with our uh, different divisions and disciplines. And I'm always delighted that uh, our customers take the time to generously supply comments, whether they're um, congratulatory or their critiques, their specificity really helps us to do a lot of great things with that survey data. Um, and on the next slide, we'll just kind of show you a couple of those things, of course, are really helping us to uh, work on the training that we could support our staff with to uh, help us to do some coaching and mentoring of our folks uh, to, to uh, recognize employees that are do really doing a phenomenal job and hopefully helping those lessons learned to be uh, distributed throughout the entire organization to pr pr improve project management everywhere. Um, our disciplines take them into account to uh, collect data from users uh, to help plow them back into tools like eReader or Oasis or Kahua so that we can make process improvements along the way. And of course, it does inform our customer communications and trainings program. So I'm just asking again, if you see those surveys come out, uh, they'll say on the top subject line, how did GSA do? And uh, we really appreciate your time uh, and thoughtful comments on them. And the last slide I have is just to remind you about uh, the folks today have talked a lot about all of the training that's coming up to explain to you the benefits and features and how to get access to these great tools that we're debuting. So we have a very robust training program through the fourth quarter. Um, so we all of our classes are available online and you can see the you can register for the upcoming classes on our CES website, uh, www.gsa.gov slash CES. Uh, and you can register there and you can also access all the resources from our past sessions. So if you've never come to a CES class before and you find something in our archives or recently completed sessions, uh, you'll be able to uh, look at those slide decks, recordings and Q and A's from past sessions. So we, we hope you'll join us for some upcoming events. Thanks, Kelly. Thank you so much, Andrea. That was a very full hour with some really great content and a lot of information. So as a reminder, we will post our session recordings and slide decks onto our website. That link will be added to the chat once more. And I really want to extend a lot of gratitude and thanks to our today's speakers for their time and presentation. And I want to thank you, our clients who are able to join us. We appreciate your time. And a big thank you to the entire customer forum team for their work behind the scenes. It is now 11 o'clock or 11.01 and we have a quick break in our program. We will reconvene at 11.15. Andrea O'Neill, the Senior Advisor on Equity will conclude the forum with a presentation on building diversity, infusing DEIA, DEIA principles into public projects. So please keep this Zoom link open. Feel free to invite your colleagues to join us for the final hour and 15 minutes or so. Take a few minutes to stretch, check your email, grab a snack, and we hope to see you for the final session at 1115. If not, thank you again so much for joining us and have a wonderful rest of your day. We'll be back soon. Hello, hello, I'm here. As a reminder, we will record this session. Okay, so a few housekeeping matters. Hello and welcome. My name is Kelly Morrison. I am a business system specialist in the New England region, the Office of Portfolio Management. 
and I have the honor of hosting um, this morning. We will go through a few housekeeping matters and then I will introduce our moderator and panelists. So thank you and welcome. This is the third and final day of the PBS Customer Forum, Focus on the Future. And in just a few minutes, I'm going to turn the mic over to Andrea O'Neill, Senior Advisor on Equity for a session on building diversity within our public projects. So before we begin, I would like to highlight a few housekeeping notes. This session is being recorded and we will publish the forum recordings and slide presentations to the GSA website. The hyperlink will be added to the chat momentarily so you can bookmark that and revisit any of the recordings from this week's forum. Attendee audio has been automatically muted to help us control the sound quality of the presentation. Closed captioning is available for this event. You can select the in-window Zoom captioning by looking at the more button on your Zoom panel and clicking view subtitles, or you can click the link below within the chat pod to open a companion window to watch side by side with your Zoom screen. Within this FedRAMP compliant Zoom for government, you can adjust the view um, in the upper right hand corner and customize your layout for your viewing experience. So we will be relying on two different Zoom pods today, both the chat and the Q&A. Please use the chat pod only for administrative or technical issues, and one of our forum team members can assist you. And we will encourage customer participation throughout this moderated panel. If you have any comments or questions for our presenters, please use the Q&A pod so we can capture those, respond live either by typing or we will address the questions at the end of the panel. So now we can open up and begin the main event. I would like to introduce the moderator of this morning's session, Andrea O'Neill. Andrea is the Senior Advisor for Equity in the Office of the Administrator. She brings to GSA an interdisciplinary and multi-sector multi acumen with 20 years of experience in equity and racial, racial justice, diverse workforce development, and economic advancement. Her experience also includes program design and delivery, and expertise in organizational behavior and cultural change. Andrea is a recognized leader in the equity field, having served as a research advisory member on the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation Equitable Futures Project, and more recently as a task force member for Brown University's Presidential Task Force on Anti-Black Racism. Andrea, thank you. I will also introduce our four esteemed panelists for this morning's presentation, beginning with David Anton, David is a Supervisory Historic Preservation Officer with GSA. Trained in art, architecture, art, and historic preservation, David wears a number of multiple, multiple disciplinary hats with GSA, ranging from historic preservation, interior design, accessibility, and film event outleasing. His enthusiasm and commitment to promoting non-binary, intersectional, and equitable workplaces has resulted in a series of national presentations on public mon monuments intersectionality and change management, all under the common thread of social justice. David is currently a champion with the GSA IDEA cohort. Next, we have Charles or Chuck Hardy. Chuck is PBS's acting chief architect, but many of you may also know him as the chief workplace officer. As GSA's lead executive in charge of workplace strategy, Chuck heads Efforts across the country with support in vital areas such as design and construction, real estate services, and procurement. He is responsible for research and development in the delivery of innovative workplace solutions throughout the federal government. Next, we have Daryl McKissick. Daryl is a professional engineer and the founder, chairwoman, and CEO of McKissick and McKissick, a national architecture engineering program and construction management firm. McKissick has worked for public and private clients in the civic, culture, energy, education, entertainment, healthcare, hospitality, housing, infrastructure, and mixed use and office sectors. McKissick and McKissick is a continuation of the nation's oldest African-American design and construction firm and traces its beginnings to Mosick, Moses McKissick, a master builder who was also a slave. And then we have Kay Sargent of HOK. Kay is a director of HOK's global workplace practice. With a passion for using design to transform how and where people work, 
She works with clients on workplace strategy and design. Based in Washington, D.C., Kay leads project teams that solve clients' business and organizational challenges related to real estate business process, strategic planning, workplace strategy, and change management. She collaborates with organizations ranging from tech startups to Fortune 500 companies to optimize their real estate portfolios and create the most innovative work experiences. Thank you all so much for being here and for dedicating your time to our forum. And with that, I will hand the mic off to Andrea. Thank you. And please begin our panel. That would be great. Thank you. Great. Um, thanks, Kelly. And uh, good morning, everyone. Uh, and hello, friends. I'm so excited to be with you today um, for this really important conversation at a time where um, momentum like never before is um, coming into the industry alongside uh, some really uh, muscular actions uh, by the administration to address diversity, equity, inclusion, accessibility. Uh, as Kelly mentioned, I'm a senior advisor for equity at GSA. I'm, uh, as an appointee in the first ever position um, at GSA in this position, I have uh, had the honor and pleasure of working alongside um, both in the interagency, and so I know we have customers on the line of GSA, as well as uh, my friend Chuck, especially, uh, we've been talking about this, I think, since the day I started last June, uh, to be able to have a holistic conversation about what it means uh, for our built environment to work for everyone. Uh, and that includes um, things related to executive orders. So as an example, uh, the president's day one executive order on advancing racial equity in underserved communities to the federal government asked all agencies to develop a set of public commitments um, that would help us um, advance equity through our high impact program areas. Um, obviously at GSA, that includes our public buildings portfolio. And I'm so excited about the list of public commitments that PBS has made uh, to think more meaningfully about customer uh, engagement uh, with uh, how our federal real estate portfolio affects uh, our environment and our communities and what we can do to help advance equity and diversity in the architecture and design fields themselves. Additionally, uh, the customer experience executive order, the president's management agenda, our strategic planning process, uh, and even special initiatives like new MOUs with, um, uh, as example, the minority, um, uh, excuse me, um, minority architects. Uh, we have uh, things related to um, RFIs. Uh, hopefully many of you have responded or, or your, uh, your networks have responded to PBS's RFI on DIA uh, current principles and practices that are happening across design and construction. And generally speaking, there is a renewed focus on how buildings work, how we uh, work in these spaces, how our spaces are built for collaboration, uh, for accessibility, and how they are uh, co-partners, or as we like to say here at GSA, community members uh, in their communities. So I'm really excited to uh, join this group of leaders and, and, and thought leaders today, experts, to talk about how DEIA can be a guiding principle, an organizing principle, and effective uh, for our buildings projects. Um, so I'd like to kick over the first question uh, to uh, Kay, just to start about, let's, let's start with universal design. Can you discuss some of the efforts that you're seeing, uh, either that you're deploying yourself or just general principles um, about how the industry is starting to focus on universal design? Yeah, sure. Thank you. Um, so I think it's interesting because, you know, this is a topic that I think people get very overwhelmed with very easily because there's just so many things to do. But we always say you kind of got to take it one step at a time. So we always say you look internally first and you think about how do we diversify internally? Uh, and then, you know, how do we build the pipeline and how do we uh, ensure that we're having a diverse um, project teams and really taking all those things into consideration. But when it comes to the actual projects, there actually is a framework out there that is a really good kind of foundation. It's kind of a, a, a launching point, and that is the universal principles of design. And so for people that may not know what those are, there are seven universal principles. And those basically are creating equitable use, flexible use is the second, the third is 
uh, making things so that they're simple and intuitive to all, because whether it's language barrier or uh, physical barriers, et cetera, just making them simple and intuitive. The fourth is that they're perceptive, right? So it's easy to understand and to understand what is being asked. The fifth is that there is uh, we try to do no harm or get rid of any kind of errors or tolerance for like zero tolerance for errors. And then also uh, the next one is low effort. So making sure that a variety of people of different abilities, shapes and sizes can access easily those spaces. And then also that we're thinking about size and space uh, for different user groups. So those are the universal principles of design. And under each one of those, I kind of have a list of things that they recommend or suggest. And so we always say, start there, because if you start there and you consider those things, you've made a really good entryway into starting to address some of those bigger pictures. Yeah, thank you. And uh, Anton, I'd like for you to build on that. Um, you know, within PBS, we've been talking a lot about human centeredness of, of these decisions and uh, thinking more meaningfully about impact. Um, so what are you seeing uh, in the field from the PBS lens? Okay, so yeah, boots on the ground. I'm in New York and the Caribbean. Um, and with our design team, so we started internally and most regions have one ABAS or accessibility officer, we decided we're gonna try something different. We trained up seven people. They're in the interior design group. They're all interior designers. So they integrate that ABAS review, the, the code compliance that we're required to do in the federal government within everything they do. So if they get an assignment that's a POR or a scaling or a DID, they're already in the mindset of looking at the path of travel through this space, they're thinking about the widths and the corridors and the bathrooms. How do people get in a building? And we always have this mantra that we say, we recognize that at any given time, 20% of the population in the country has a physical disability or challenge. So if you design for that 20%, you're gonna automatically meet the 100%. So instead of designing a flight of stairs on a brand new courthouse, why not bring that building down to grade so that all people can enter the building equally at all times. Um, the other thing we do is a praxis of training. So we have all of our designers go out to our colleagues in the different divisions and we train them. We're constantly being trained. We're networking with the other regions and with the national office. And we're integrating the ABAS program into historic preservation best practices, design excellence. The integration of this program is what is the success and it's the same to be true with DEIA. All DEIA means is a recognition of diversity and good leadership. And so that's what we're doing in the region. Okay, thank you. Um, Daryl, I'd love to bring you into the conversation now. If you can talk a little bit about some of the you know, key questions or decisions um, that are uh, driving more accessibility and diversity in the built environment. Okay, well, you know, ideas and um, and I mean, well, ideas come from thought process, and the thought process comes from our beliefs. Everything we do, our behavior, our attitude, how we talk to people, all of that comes from a thought process and a belief. And we have created exclusionary um, environments even though we may be using a universal design uh, program <laughs> because we're not listening to all groups of people when we're designing a space. Um, we can sometimes go in with preconceived notions, um, not listening to uh, diverse groups as intently or as intentional as we listen to other groups. And so we think that we are being equitable, but we're not being equitable because it starts with how we interact with the people and who we talk to. We have to talk to all people that are gonna be in that space and be sensitive to those people. And I think that's a major thing that has been missed. And you know, I just think about Maya Angelou's statement of, you know, people don't remember what you say, they remember what you, how you made them feel. 
And if you wanna really know how people are going to feel an environment, operate an environment, you've got to talk to them with the same respect, the same openness that you would talk to someone who looks like you. Um, and I just, that's, I think is the key thing um, to get an, an inclusionary design and space. We're going to touch on stakeholder engagement a little later in the conversation. Um, but Kay, can uh, you outline the principles for us? Can you talk yeah. a little bit about how that looks in operational life every day on the ground? Yeah, yeah well, you know, and I want to pick up what Daryl said because you know I think she's right. Look, it's really hard to put yourself in somebody else's shoes, as much as we try to do that. And I think it really starts with having empathy and listening and realizing that everybody's experience is different. And I'm going to tell you a story. Um, about something that happened to me. I went to visit one of our clients and they had just finished a space and it was a two-story atrium with a sweeping glass, beautiful staircase in the middle. And they were so excited about it. And the CEO wants to show me around and there are people milling around underneath the spaces and throughout, et cetera. And he's like, yeah, let's, you know, let's walk up to the second floor. I want, I want you to you know, kind of see and experience this whole thing. And I kind of looked at him and I said, well, is there, is there an elevator that I can take? And he goes, no, 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 you gotta walk up the staircase. Like it's a whole part of the experience. And I looked down and I was wearing a skirt. And I looked over underneath that glass staircase where a group of men were gathering, having a meeting. And I said, I think I'd rather take the elevator if that's okay with you. And all of a sudden he just had this look of horror on his face because he realized that for a woman to walk up that staircase was not the same experience that he was going to have because of course, you know, of that. And, and nobody intentionally did that, but they just didn't think it through and they didn't see it through somebody else's eyes or somebody else's perspective. And so the more we have tried to address some of these discussions and topics, the more we listen to what Daryl said we have to listen and understand that everybody has unique experiences and to really start by trying to have some empathy and some broader perspective about how different people experience the same space or the same environment. And Kate, to add to that, I mean, our forefathers did not have a restroom for women in the Senate because they never thought a belief mm. that we were gonna have women in the Senate. So Daryl, uh, you're going to make me age myself here, but, but I'm going to do it because you just slapped down that challenge. One of my very first jobs in 1986 as a young designer was potty parity because a lot of government buildings were not designed for women. So I had to go in in the general accounting office and the uh, Pentagon at that time and help survey and then reposition all of the restrooms so that women actually could have a place to go while they were working in those buildings. Because before that time, it was very challenging. Well, thank you for sharing um, those very powerful uh, anecdotes. And, uh, and, and how old I am. <laughs> well, uh, we will uh, defer from that line of questioning, but more so, uh, you know, uh, celebrating the arc of justice, the arc of justice and how it's bending in the right direction here. Uh, and Chuck, you know, we've talked a lot uh, about just um, the importance of stakeholder engagement and not necessarily uh, you know, projecting ourselves into someone else's reality, but actually bringing them to the table, right? Asking them what they think, what they need to make sure we're solving the problems that are central to, to, to their actual needs. So can you talk a little bit about what the stakeholder engagement process looks like at, at PBS and how we're pulling in those diverse voices to make sure we're getting it right the first time? Great, great question. Thank, thanks for having me today. Um, it really is leading and uh, what Daryl and, and Kay just mentioned is listening is, is paramount. Uh, I keep telling people I, I can solve, or at least I know what Chuck's problems are, but I really need to know what other folks are, and you do that by listening. And so we convened an idea roundtable with associations and industry participants just to have the conversation around what's on top of mind for some folks. What are some things that are out there that are that are troubling in the industry that we need to, to address? And so that was one way to start building building the community around this, uh, striking partnerships with associations and, and building that coalition even further. Programs like uh, the ACE Mentor Program that gets inner city high school students interested in architecture, construction, engineering, building. Um, 
and, and building the ships, as I say, so providing mentorships, scholarships, internships, and getting people the opportunity and the entry into our business in a, in a meaningful way with the support structure there. And so this is just good all around. It, it, it starts to um, get to the point of where that value is, not only for your companies, for your agencies, for the projects, but just for, for everyone involved. And as you can do that, uh, you start to get the excitement around it. Uh, we partner with organizations like, the, like uh, Andrea mentioned, the National Association of Minority Architects. We recently signed a partnership with them to help each other sit on each other's uh, design panels, uh, help uh, educate uh, folks on the government hiring process and, and also the government uh, procurement process on how to get jobs with us. So uh, giving them uh, opportunities to hear and the tools they need to be far more competitive in the industry that, that's becoming more and more competitive. Uh, in our design excellence program, we have we've created what we're calling an emerging voices cohort of design peers uh, that reflect America. And they're gonna be in the business for decades and they're coming to the table to help inform design today. So if you as an agency have some issues and, and some things you wanna talk about, we've got peers from across industry that are noted in the field from entry level uh, coming in to seasoned veterans that can bring forth some ideas, topics, and, and uh, some conversation around that. And so we're looking to manage this new Emerging Voices cohort as a group versus how we've done in the past with our design peers as individuals to start to see if we can make some change in the industry. And finally, internally, we have a cohort of Emerging Voices interns we just hired a year ago. Uh, and this is a, a diverse group of folks bringing fresh perspectives and life to the program from within. Uh, so simply put, I mean, to, to build stakeholder uh, engagement in groups, it's creating access and opportunity on, on a multiple, uh, multiple fronts. So. Yeah, uh, that's it's really important, Chuck. And and like you said, uh, it's not just one effort. It's a it's a multilateral, interdisciplinary uh, strategy to really pull community voices into the conversation. Um, and Anthony, one of the biggest opportunities we have, I think, a flashpoint across government is the bipartisan infrastructure law and the amount of dollars being deployed on the ground in communities for infrastructure uh, improvements and development. Um, and one of the uh, exciting things that I've seen come out of uh, that work. Um, uh, is um, the ability to, uh, you know, focus on cultural preservation, focus on uh, community reflection through the art and architecture program, as an example, um, and uh, really signaling, uh, as Kay was saying, what the values are, uh, what, what, what our um, organizing principles are as we think about these projects. Um, so can you talk a little bit about uh, where you think um, how federal government should be thinking about uh, bringing community stakeholders to the table or the kinds of things in mind as we as we think about meaningful stakeholder engagement outside of compliance. Yeah, and, and so I've been with GSA 20 years. I started as the historic preservation officer and I was pretty much the grim reaper. I was the person who would <laughs> slow your project down. And so a lot of times um, on timing when within budget, think of stakeholders wrongfully is, is not worthy as worthy as the client agency as a primary stakeholder. And we have to remember that these buildings are gifts to the American public, whether the buildings land in suburban, urban, or rural areas, and they provide a springboard for economic development for those communities. So we want to give that opportunity to the community and not lead to gentrification. And all that means is Gentrification is advantaging one population, an incoming population at the cost of that existing population. So the first thing is doing better at identifying our internal and external stakeholders and how they wax and wane through the duration of a project. During the planning stages, your key stakeholders are going to be GSA, the client agency, um, and the funding source and maybe political bodies. And as you move into design, you're going to have your architect take the lead and you're going to have NEPA and the birds and the bees and historic preservation compliance come into play. But as you move to construction, you have to recognize that the stakeholders that are going to emerge are the contractors and that the NEPA compliance is already under mitigation. So it can take a sidestep. And so by a PM recognizing that, they can focus greater in attention on where those needs are and they can manage those stakeholder needs. 
And again, the ultimate goal is to have the building do more than what it was designed to do, to go beyond to serve the public in all kinds of ways. And all of our buildings, old and new, we have great examples of how we're doing that. And so the buildings that aren't doing that, we should say to ourselves, what more can this building be besides designed as a federal building or a courthouse? How can it go above and beyond to become a pride of place for that community? Really important. Um, and so, you know, um, you mentioned economic development or downstream uh, ancillary impacts and, and benefit. Um, and one of those, uh, uh, as another uh, connected to administration's agenda, is about uh, supporting small disadvantaged businesses and driving economic recovery and advancement. Uh, so, uh, Daryl, over to you to talk a little bit about how you see the supplier universe and, and how we can, um, you know, through these large scale capital projects, um, also pull uh, more folks into the contracting universe. Yeah, well, these um, large scale governmental um, bills that pass a lot of money for construction have left out a swath of America. And it's these diverse groups. And so now we have this great opportunity to do something about it, to tighten the gap between blacks and whites and women and men. Um, you know, and it's all about setting correct policy. Uh, because the policies now do not meet diverse companies where they are, and they truly are not leveling the playing field. Um, I have just launched a new organization with some of the top CEOs in our industry, as well as some of the national minority companies throughout the AEC industry um, to really move the needle on this. I mean, our goal is to bring solutions to clients on how to um, make minority firms tier ones and prime contractors on your work. Um, and that's outside of our industry, but how inside as, as major architectural engineering and construction firms, how can we build up smaller companies by bringing them in as major subs? And, and meeting them where they are and training them. I mean, McKissick, that is one of our pillars, the building of capacity of minority firms. We've done it on every project and we've done it in every city that we've worked in. And it's simple. I mean, I'll give you a quick example. When we started the, as the project managers of the DC Convention Center 20 years ago, and we knew we were gonna move 2 million cubic yards of dirt and we started looking at trucking companies to move this because we're thinking this is a large sum of money. Um, we could not find a, a strong minority local firm that could do this. So we pulled together a couple of people with trucks and helped them start their business. By the time they finished the convention center, they had 20 trucks and they were a business. When we moved over to the national ballpark, they came there with 20 trucks. Um, then we did the um, DC schools and, it, and then other things for the federal government. But that's how you really build capacity. You've got to meet companies where, where they are. You've got to set policies that truly reflect um, fairness and equity. Um, because for example, you know, you ask for someone to be a designer or contractor for a major building. And then you say, well, whoever has the most building, building experience in the last five years is gonna get this job. Well, some of these firms have never worked for GSA. They've never worked for a Microsoft. So they've never had an opportunity to even say or even present to you how they can work. So there has to be some policy set that will open the door and allow people to do this. I had a, and this is, I'm sorry, I'm going a little longer than I should, but I had experience with one of the tech companies, a major tech company, and they wanted us to design, they said, we want you to be the project manager of a data center. So tell us, you know, how many data centers have you done in the last five years? How many, your project exec, have they done like five data centers in the last five years? 
And I wrote him back and I said, we are a medium-sized minority woman-owned firm. We have never had the opportunity to design, to build, to project manage a data center. But we have provided project management and design on some of the world, the country's landmark projects that are much more complicated with a lot more stakeholders, high visibility than a data center. And you know what they wrote back and said, forget all of that, everything we just said, we still wanna work with you. You have to give people an opportunity. And so I, you know, I hope that we're getting there today, especially, I think that's what the administration wants to do. I'm sure with the infrastructure bill, that's what they wanna do. And um, so I think it's just a matter of changing policy. I hope that our new organization, AEC Unites, which is made up of all of people in our industry, and we can bring those solutions to clients. Thank you very much uh, for, for that um, comprehensive answer, Daryl. And it, and it speaks to um, the level of deliberate, uh, intentional you know, focus on uh, shifting the, the current reality in the supplier ecosystem, because without those interventions, it doesn't, <laughs> it's not going to, this, this arc of justice is in that organically <laughs> shift itself. It is, is going to take all of us to um, actually be pulling on it. Um, Kay, anything you'd like to add to the supply diversity conversation or, um, and, and I wanted to maybe ask you specifically about, because what I'm hearing in the narrative is, you know, lack of capital, too small for these size of projects, or maybe our buildings are getting too sophisticated. And so there's, you know, the level of technology or special materials or all the things that are kind of, you know, uh, preventing people from really uh, driving supplier diversity? Well, here's what I would say, and I'm going to take it from a slightly different angle. We're a large firm. We have, uh, you know, 26 offices internationally all over the world, and we do a lot of really big, hairy, messy projects and also then, you know, smaller ones. But we believe that it is our responsibility, if not our moral obligation, to uh, tap into a diverse talent base. And so we have always tried to do that, but, you know, tried to do it. We are now mandating that we do this on all of our projects. So we have created a whole database of uh, smaller minority owned companies that we can tap into called HOK Tapestry, so that we're vetting and ready to go when we have projects and, you know, we have a week to respond to something. So we can already look on that list and pull some people off of there. We're, we often on projects that we're going after can have up to 20 subcontractors. So there's an amazing opportunity for us to bring in a diverse group of individuals that will benefit us because of the resource shortage, that will benefit us in the project because they're bringing a unique expertise and a different perspective. And it will benefit them because then they can say, I did work on some of these big projects. I was a sub on some of these, but it's a launch pad for them then to take on bigger things. And it's fabulous to see companies that we've worked with over time that are now, you know, either we're competing with them or they're coming to us and saying, hey, we want to partner with you. We're going to bring you into our opportunity, right? And so look, all ships rise when the tide goes up. And I think we all have an obligation to really make sure that we're diversifying our subcontractors and our partners and who we're bringing in and giving them meaningful, substantial efforts to help them then launch going forward. And Kay, I just want to add, you know, Bill called me, Bill Kelmuth called, and he said, Daryl, we should team up on this $400 million hospital together and we're going to be 50-50. And we're 50-50. So when I hear things about us being minority firms or women firms being too small, undercapitalized, or the job being too sophisticated, I just get angry. And the reason why is because a lot of firms are small because of policy set by the federal government that says if your revenues are too high, you are no longer Black, you're no longer a woman, okay, you can't compete in the right. small business arena or the minority or woman arena because of your net worth and the revenue of your company. Well, that right there throttles a lot of companies from being all that they could be. So yeah. too small, you know, too sophisticated, all of that comes from the policies 
and the systematic racism and and um and sexism that we've had in this country for so many years. Yeah, well, and now we're trying to write it. These people are not the victims. They are not the victims. They have been things have happened to them and they're smart. They would be capitalized. I mean, the hardest thing for me to do when I started my company was to get to go to a bank and get money. Yeah. When I finally got to a bank, they told me, we're going to give you the money, but we want your husband to sit in the room with you. And I said, but his assets are not going on this. My assets are going on this. And they said, well, it just makes us feel better. So I'm not a victim. Women, minorities, whatever, we are not the victim here. We have been victimized, okay? But it doesn't mean that we're not strong, we're not capable, and that we can't do the work. We can do the work if given a fair opportunity and given the same um, entry at that other firms, majority firms have. There's no reason why my company and my family, which started be before HOK, my family goes back 200 years. My great great grandfather was a slave, a builder as a slave, bought his freedom because he made bricks, he learned the trade of making bricks in Africa, brought it over here, passed it down. My grandfather started our business in 1905. Why are we not as big as HOK? Why are we not as big as Turner? Turner started in 1903. I used to work at Turner. And it's because everything around us has tried to hold us back. And it's not that we weren't good, it's not that we can't think, it's not that we're lazy. It's, we have been held back by systems and policies, which go back to what I said earlier, is beliefs. Beliefs set ideology, ideology sets systems and policies and principles, and that's what's lived out. Well, maybe we need more Bill Helmuth in the world because I will tell you, he is a truly inspirational leader. And the fact that he reached out to you, saw the value that you bring and wanted you to be a 50-50 equal partner, I think says a lot. So maybe we need more of those. We definitely need more Bill. Bill is one of my founding members of AEC Unites. Oh, good. Yeah, he was at my very first meeting. He was there and, you know, he actually agreed to having the... Um, minority split and DC local split all the way down from the engineers. We picked them all together. Bill and I started at the whole thing together and we're working on it together. And he's- I'll give him back when I see him later. <laughs> amazing, yeah, that's amazing. And Chuck, I, I'd love to bring you into this conversation because you know, Anton mentioned on time one budget, you know, Daryl just, you know, frankly dropped the mic on all of the systemic issues that in the naysaying that comes up in these projects and where, you know, where we're trying to advance equity and it's maybe seen as a burden uh, to the project. But we know if we're not getting this right on the front end, we're going to pay for it on the back end, right? These, there's an opportunity cost along this con, uh, complete uh, decision-making process, but, we're, but they're unseen, they're unaccounted for, not quantified, but they're festering. Uh, right, and, and we pay for it one way or another. So uh, can you talk about some of those other, you know, kind of uh, big barriers to really advancing this work? We know it's not all puppies and rainbows. We know this is real money on the line, uh, but, you know, again, with intention and, and deliberate action, we can, we can change the landscape. Yeah, I think, and, and Daryl hit on it, it's, it's the way we ask for things and the way uh, the responses come in that, um, I want the pushback. I want people asking us or saying, why do you have this requirement in there? What is this doing for you? What is your intention here? So we can get to understand what we're trying to get in a project and then make sure we're getting the right people on the project. Um, and it, it is one where we have to be partners in this. Uh, I'll, I'll give you a kind of a quick story on a, on a small business. And it, and it gets to the point of growing folks too large where they go out of the system and then the, then the system just forgets them. Um, but this was a painting contractor that was doing great work um, that we needed a, a chambers built out. And it was like, hey, do you, you guys want to expand your work? And they're like, well, you know, they're kind of hemming and hawing a little bit, but 
you kind of talk them into it and say, no, you do good work. You have the ability to kind of make sure that they understand that and, and got them to come after that job. And they worked them themselves all the way up to building a border station for us. And it's the support that we need to provide our industry partners uh, to make sure that we're taking care of them as much as they're taking care of us um, and, and working together to figure out what those problems are. And so we do need, uh, there's, there's always this concern, well, if I push back, if I challenge this, that's going to hurt me on the next, next solicitation or whatever it is. But no, I think it, it can only help. And so by having those conversations, by having that openness, uh, our outreach to the community is just that. We're trying to figure out uh, and I've seen so many uh, weird ideas of clauses to put in the solicitations and contracts that it's, it's mind numbing, but I want to make sure we're putting the right things and that we're driving the right behaviors, that we're changing the right, the right things. We're at a point in time that the opportunity is just like the workplace conversation is once in a generation. I think we're in a once in a generation opportunity to really change uh, the industry, the dialogue around this. And, and when you look at uh, and everybody in this call knows uh, that craft labor in the country is not increasing. Uh, we don't have people going into, uh, you know, tech opportunities, but they should, should as far as craft labor goes. Uh, Ace Mentor has been around for a while and still challenging to get people into the industry. And so I, I think it's the conversation. I, I mean, we're willing to listen, but unless people speak up and feel, feel free to speak up, we're not going to know what challenges are out there and we're going to continue to do what we're doing. And so I, I, I truly appreciate Daryl's comments and, and Kate's comments today because that's what helps inform our actions. And so, uh, and from the agencies on the phone, I mean, this, this sounds like there's a lot of, there's a, this is a heavy lift um, for our agency partners. We're asking you to join us in this, in this conversation and understand that, you know, we don't have to go to somebody that built something seven times before uh, just to hire somebody for a project. I, I really want somebody, uh, this was on a courthouse once where we talked to an architect and he said, never done this before. He goes, but that causes me to listen and, and learn what, what it is you do and solve your problem, not to bring you one of the seven courthouses I did in the last seven years kind of thing. And, and that's really, as we start looking at things, the more we can bring people to the table the more it actually enables the listening piece, which then gets to the creative problem solving, which then gets us to a, a more collective uh, solution. So anyway. And if I could build off what Chuck said, and also internally allowing our workforce to feel that comfortable sense to also say things. Uh, very quick story. I was on an AEIDIQ selection and one of the criteria factors was they had to submit a project that was LEED certified. So unfortunately, the very top scoring firm had to be disqualified because they technically didn't submit a, a, a project that was LEED certified. And the story was, it was a Buddhist temple and the Buddhist congregation decided that money was better spent serving the people of their, um, their, their institution. Even though they designed the building for sustainability, they didn't get that LEED rating. And so it was a very simple fix the next time around there are other rating systems. So, you know, US Green Building Council lead rating or approved equal. Prove to us that you designed that building because what we're concerned about is meeting a sustainable performance. And so that's a small thing that we couldn't fix in the moment, but we fixed on other contracts here on out. And so that's what we have to do is look at solicitations to see, are there little embedded advantages for certain firms that might not seem obvious. And there's a lot of that going on. Is it de jure, de facto? And you can dig into that and you'll always find something that will allow the contract solicitation to be a little more equitable for people to bid and to have a favorable position on getting on the short list or even getting the contract. Okay, um, just to bring you into the conversation. So we've got you know finite resources, timelines, you know, we've got to be, it's real estate. You've got to be real about it. There's, there's, there's a pragmatic approach to this stuff. So, uh, and, and a lot of uh, what we were just talking about is in dynamic tensions with the, with the marketplace uh, currently. And so, uh, you know, what are you seeing as an actual low hanging fruit or things that can be, um, be done uh, to, to bring more, let's, let's call it a symbiosis uh, to some of these problems. 
Yeah, I, look, I, I, I think we need to just, um, you know, be proactive. Okay, so if you're waiting until you get a proposal and then you have to put it together, you're probably already behind and it's too late. It's about reaching out in advance. It's about building those relationships. It's about connecting and having people in the queue and being prepared. And then it's about starting to work together. And, and you know, a lot of it is having that confidence um, in, in your partners. And so being able to engage them in smaller opportunities that can lead into bigger opportunities and or depending, you know, like, I mean, somebody like Daryl, who's got an amazing portfolio and has been in the business a long time, there's not a lot of, uh, of trust issues that we're going to have there because it's well established, right? So diving in, embracing that and going forward. And I think, you know, one of the biggest challenges right now is every firm is stretched very thin because of the resources, because of the activity, because of just all the dynamics that we're dealing with right now. And so we have to find ways that we all can be better together. So building those relationships, making those connections, doing your homework ahead of time so that when you get those proposals, you already know, hey, we've got you know two or three people queued up that would be awesome to bring in and to be a partner on this or whatever. That's, that's really, I think, the approach that we need to be taking going forward. And you know, Kate, I would just build on what you just said about labor supply and, and, and worker supply, okay? Everybody's having a hard time with capacity and people. And the thought process used to be if you were a majority firm, a big firm, you just have a lot of people. So if person A is, doesn't work out, they can throw on person B and make that switch in five minutes. That is no longer the case. No one has any switch out ability anymore. I mean, it's just really tight. And I think that has actually opened the door for smaller firms and minority firms and women firms to really have opportunity because clients are now saying, well, okay, maybe you can do it. <laughs> maybe you can supply these people. And big firms are calling and saying, I need help. Do you have anybody that can do this? And um, so it's very tough times, Chuck, and I appreciate what you're saying too about ACE mentoring. I'm on the executive board trying to really help push the needle on that as well. And it's, you know, we need a whole lot more people in our pipeline, but it's gonna take time. It's just not gonna happen overnight. And the amount of construction that's happening is not going away. You know, we're just strapped. So we have to use all the underutilized resources that haven't been utilized in the past, we have to use those now in order to be able to meet the demand. And so it's kind of worked out good for the people who have been left behind because we need their, their expertise. We need their abilities at this point in our industry. Yeah, and I, I would if just add, engage. yeah, and I would if just add, Trade-offs always bugs me because I think we're, we're leveraging value and opportunity. We're not, trade-off sounds like you're losing something. And, and I think by tapping into the resources out there, uh, it, it really is creating value. And I think that that's how you create good supplier diversity by bringing, increasing the bench, not going back to the same folks and, and making a trade-off and saying, well, I guess we can't go after this one because we just don't have the right people. Just keep building the bench. And that's, that's where the value and the opportunity is. Yeah, Chuck, I'd like to stay with you a little bit uh, to talk about Good Neighbor. And, you know, um, and I, we have a, a, a suite of projects that, you know, have community benefit, have driven uh, ancillary value behind, but beyond, you know, on time, on budget and compliance, and that are, you know, of benefit to the to the community. Um, and I know that's, you know, it's a particular focus of the Good Neighbor program, but these are principles that we could be scaling throughout the portfolio in the federal real estate, um, just design and construction um, ethos. So uh, is there one particular project that stands out of your mind of something that, you know, like we were able to square all the circles, it was, you know, just uh, a miracle, <laughs> or, or something that, you know, is, you know, going to be, uh, you know, not, not just the acceptance of the rule, but like kind of really uh, could be that, that example of uh, how federal government should be working on these projects. No, I, I think there's a lot out there. I mean, the one that comes to mind is a Columbus land port of entry uh, where we worked with the community. We worked with the folks that were actually going through that, that port of entry. Uh, and a lot of them were students coming from uh, Mexico into the country to go to school every day. And so the, the, uh, 
the building itself became an educational tool as they waited in line of things to do. And it was all about experiential design and what happened while uh, they were going through this process every day. But then also looking to the community to see how that border station, that port of entry supports local economy and things like that. So it's bringing all that together and having uh, an integrated conversation and not the one-off conversations of people uh, that are easier to have uh, and a little less complex. But as you have these complex conversations, um, they're just, they bring out really cool solutions. And it's uh, the same architect that did that actually uh, it got a contract to do the rest areas around Texas. And I was talking with her and uh, this is Elizabeth Chu Richter. Um, and she said, when we got that job, it was with rest areas. And, and if you look at a rest area and see a rest area, you're going to get a rest area. And she goes, I looked at this as an opportunity where I want, you know, my spouse to go in there and go to the bathroom and come back. I'll go, no, you got to come in and see this. This is really cool where the project becomes something different. And so when you start looking to be meaningful to the population you're touching, thinking beyond the block when we touch a prop, when we touch a design, that good neighbor program is meant to reach out to the community to find out how we can leave uh, the, 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 the city and the surroundings a little better than we touched. Uh, that our facilities can be just as important uh, what happens in them but what happens around them and so yeah columbus is a great example but i could go into toledo and many others have done where when we effectively engage communities we do some really cool things and, and we want to do that and at times from an agency stand partner agency standpoint for the, so for the customers on the line uh, working with you all because you share these same goals and so our wins can be your wins and then vice versa and so uh, it, it, it's all good. And I think at the end of the day, you have a better solution coming out of it. It starts to speak toward a, a, a tax, or attraction and retention of employees, all those kind of things. Uh, I just think happen when you do have those conversations. So, and, and just a plug for the fine arts program, we've been doing it for a very long time, like working with individual artists and trying to pick the right artists for that community to create a sense of Pride of Place, like the Calder Flamingo in Chicago, where Nick Cave now is working on a project for a courthouse. And so we're trying to do better at match that artist with the community. And part of that is going back and know, letting the artists know where the opportunities are. How do you even apply to get on the registry for the artist? And it's the same with students that go to HBCUs. How do you even know how to apply for a federal job or a job at HOK or with McKissick? And so a lot of students don't know that process. And so going in there and educating them as to this is how it's done. I was so naive when I interviewed for GSA with Rolando Rivas Camp, the amazing Rolando, that I thought when I read the description and it kept saying PBS, I thought I was gonna be on public broadcasting. You know, I, I thought I can do that. I'm pretty good in front of the camera. I had no idea what PBS stood for in GSA. So that's how, na I na how naive I was as a privileged white person. And I can't imagine what it's like for a person of color to try to try to find their foot in the door in some of these institutions. And the other thing I wanna say about Chuck, we's, we've also been doing a pretty good job at building buildings for community. And if I said, imagine a major federal building that had 20 immigration courtrooms and an SSA office and an IRS, 30 story building in New York City. And then I said, imagine if that building were a major museum, free and open to the public with public programming. And you might say, well, that can't be done because we have to segregate the federal workforce from the private sector. We have to harden our buildings. Well, think again, because we're doing it at the Ted Weiss Federal Building with the African American Museum, a major museum, and the National Park Service activates that lobby and the, and the National Monument on a frequent basis. And I could go from region to region and show you examples of farmers markets and cafes that are open to the community at street level and all kinds of ways we're doing it. And again, the question is when a building isn't doing more than the nine to five, how can we build off that to again, make the community feel proud about these buildings and to begin to own them in other ways that aren't just federal workforce centers? Ben, okay, so 
round robin, uh, quick answers, buzzword, kind of lightning round. We are in this uh, historic opportunity, once in a generation type of opportunity with focus and resources. So what is one thing that you think that the industry or federal government can be doing now to make a substantial difference? Uh, and Daryl, I'll start with you. In historical or just how to make a difference, period, an impact. Because if impact, that's- Impact in this historic moment that we have to actually- Oh, in this historic the, moment, okay, In great. this historic moment to get stuff done. Um, well, I think it's to spend money with underutilized people. And it's not just individuals, because of course the in individuals have not had the true, the same opportunities, you know, for working in government positions, but also minority companies and women have not had the same opportunities. So the biggest impact is doing something about the economic, economic impact. That's what I would say. <laughs> okay. Yeah, so, so I would say, I think um, the most important thing that we're doing is that, you know, we have talked the talk for a long time. But we have got to put something in place that forces us to hold ourselves accountable. And so internally as a firm, we are we literally are creating checklists and, and educating champions in every office that then will trickle down further and putting things in process in every phase of design to say, pause. Are you including the community? Are you getting diverse perspectives? Are you engaging people of a variety of spectrums? Are you involving them in the process? Are you engaging with them? Like we literally continually and, and have to put it top of mind and force ourselves to check it. And I, and I hate to say check a box, but it's making us you know, physically have to do it and constantly reminding us. We can't just think about it once and then be like, done. It has to, it has to, we have to build that muscle in our brains to get us to do this. And then all of a sudden it just becomes second nature to us. So we're putting those things in place to start building those core strengths within ourselves and within our firm that will then hopefully become just the way we normally practice going forward. Yeah. Accountability and redirecting resources in a way that we have not before. Uh, Anthon, uh, anything from historical preservation or cultural preservation side? Um, I, I always say no matter what you do, if you're fine arts, HP, a PM, a, a contracting officer, you have the responsibility and obligation to make a difference. And you do have that power to do that because that's how you eat an elephant is one spoonful at a time. This isn't going to happen overnight. As Daryl knows, this is going to be an ongoing thing that we live with, but we can move the needle. So what I find very um, encouraging is that over the course of uh, two years, basically George Floyd really was a catalyst for this conversation. We have been having discussions about public monuments, how we name our buildings, should who's making those decisions and for whom. Who do they lift and who do they oppress? And that's really difficult, but it's also very exciting. And so I'm energized, but it's going to take a long time and it's going to require a lot of ongoing training at all levels from the top down and from the boots on the ground up. So we meet in the middle and I'm seeing that change happening, but there's a whole lot more to do. And this is about collective efficacy. So Chuck, over to you. I want to talk about, you know, how do we catalyze our federal customers to, uh, you know, think differently about their design requirements and processes and work with GSA on a collaborative effort uh, to uh, make these uh, changes that we've been talking about? Yeah, I, I think it's, it's in, the, in a kind of a buzzword way, it's just listening and acting kind of thing. So we do have to listen, do we have to act. I'm a little... Uh, a little less patient than Anton is. <laughs> I want to, this needs to happen now. We need to act on these things. We need to learn and then we need to adjust kind of thing. And so uh, we, we can't in design, we can't in, 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 in many of the things in our industry. Internet connections bouncing around, um, but we can't just wait. And so, uh, we do need to engage. We do need to look at universal design as a default. We need to, need to make our buildings uh, accessible 
uh, to all in the same way. It starts saving money. It starts doing the right things. It's, it does all those kind of things. But if we listen and act and look for that value, uh, I think that's going to move the industry. And from the client's perspective, we'll give you a better t solution to what your ask is, the problem you're trying to solve kind of thing, that we can come up with some really cool solutions if we all work together on that. So, so Andrea, I'm uh, sorry. Uh, yeah. I don't know, but um, back to what Dave was saying, and you know, Dave, what you said was beautiful. Um, we are in a transformation, and this transformation is we're only two years into it, and so there are going to be mistakes. And I do believe that there are more good people in the world than there are bad people in the world, which means we have people out here that have the right intent but we have biases because of blindness. So it's not that people have bad intent, they're just blind. And so we can be sympathetic about that. Um, having conversations like this and not being afraid to really talk about blind spots is really how we overcome. This is how we um, you know, heal and we can come together as a group and see that we're not so different. We all kind of want the same thing and we're, we're really close. It's just, we're different in these other different great ways. And so if we embrace all of that, not just celebrate it, you gotta embrace it. You've gotta bring all that energy in, <laughs> okay? <laughs> Yeah, there's a, firm that sent a num it, there's a firm that's done a number of buildings for GSA all across the country. And the head of this firm is very innovative. He thinks outside the box, but you know what else he does? He surrounds himself with people of diversity, of age, of expertise, of cultures and ethnicities. And he allows them a seat at the table and he allows them to speak their opinions and and participate in that decision-making. And that's how they come up with innovative solutions. And that's why they do what they do. And GSA is set up to do the same. We already have the diversity, but if we just did a better job at allowing people a seat at the table and to really feel comfortable doing the job they were hired to do and being accountable for that, it takes longer like in a marriage to have a conversation where you're battling it out but it always ends up with a solution one person couldn't have imagined. And so that's what's so exciting about this whole diversity thing. It's not because we're trying to check a box or meet a quote, quota. We're doing that, but it's also good for our innovation and creativity. It's a known fact that people who walk the walk are 25% more productive if they practice that diversity than companies that just talk the talk. Yeah. You're on mute, Andrea. Sorry, my computer froze. Uh, the connection is contagious, Chuck. So uh, the question from the audience that I think is important to maybe infuse now, um, and it's how, uh, what policies can the federal government leverage to actually um, improve the supplier diversity that we've been talking about? Um, and I know, and I'll just add that there are some, um, you know, efforts in place again, related to the um, agency action plans uh, that were in response to the executive order, where there is a, uh, a government-wide effort to address equity and procurement. Um, and it's supercharging the um, technical assistance, it's leveraging the SBA's uh, new policies, it's um, um, raising the goals for small but disadvantaged business spend and uh, socioeconomic disadvantaged spend, um, working with the Office of Small Business Utilization. So there is there are some policies uh, in place uh, that are you know aggressive and coordinated. Uh, but uh, but Daryl, uh, especially you had uh, some really impassioned things to say about you know it, is that going to actually trickle downstream to the marketplace for the folks that need it on the ground? Uh, so any any just reaction to to that or to, to answer the question? Well, I, I want to Daryl's I question. Oh, sorry. Yeah, yeah well, I, I want to ask. I want to ask you a question. I want to tell you my perception, but I want you to tell me if I, you think I'm right or not from yours. I actually think the government asks the most of us of any of our clients. It's our corporate clients don't usually ask as much as what the government is asking. It doesn't mean that the government can't and shouldn't do more, right? But I actually believe that you're probably ahead of the corporations. And so to me, 
maybe one of the things you could do to nudge everybody else is to require, not just on your projects, but ask your suppliers, what are they doing from a diversity standpoint as a whole outside of just on the projects that you are requiring? Because any and all supply, you think about it, everybody does business with the government, right? And so if you start mandating that for companies and asking, what are they doing? They're gonna to wanna to have a better answer to that question. So Dara, do you see that? So yes, but I, so it depends on what government it is, okay. You know, Ward Connolly went across the country from California to the East Coast, getting rid of minority and women um, requirements. So now it went to small business, but minority and women want to grow outside of small businesses. They want to be a medium-sized business and a large business. When the 8A program started, it was started to help minority firms and women firms. There was no requirements, I mean, no ceilings on revenue and net worth. Later, and that was started during the Nixon administration. Then the Reagan administration came in and said, oh, we know a way to slow it down. And that's when they put in the NAICS codes. And that's when they put in the revenue restrictions, the number of employee restrictions and all of that. So I always say if an administration can put that in, an administration should be able to take that completely out, okay? Yeah. And um, that's what we need. And you are right. Policy that is set with the government is usually echoed by private industry. Um, when Barack Obama was in office, maybe just because he was a black president, <laughs> my um, corporate America said, we wanna work with black folks, okay? But when he left and Trump came in, I mean, it was a different situation. Then George Floyd, you know, what happens to him? Then all of a sudden, corporate America, they want to work with Black people again. Um, you know, it, it needs to be sustainable. I have so many times gotten in the door, right? And then it's like, okay, I've built the capacity. I'm doing this job. I've never done this type before. Where's my next job? And it's not there. You know, I feel like majority firms are on welfare. They get the same job over and over and over again. They get to move their staff from one job to the next job to the next job. Minority firms, small firms, women firms need sustainability. So they need to be able to go from one job to the next. So I would say to government agencies and private industries, I'm working with them on private companies on this, you know, if you're going to have us do the construction management of a of a an energy state station substation have another one in mind for us to work on the next one you've got enough because you have three majority firms working on six of them at the same time mm -hmm. so you really have a pipeline of work so why not figure out how to keep that pipeline of work going Yeah. And, and Chuck, I want to bring this back to not the supply diversity conversation, but uh, really just call to action for all of our agency partners that are on the line. What are some quick things they can do, you know, actionable things right now as they're thinking about working with GSA, the kinds of requests that should, they should be thinking about building in, um, maximizing what's available to them in the FMR uh, to help drive accessibility, universal design principles, et cetera. I think the biggest thing is just reach out to us with, with what you're working on and what your uh, you know, issues you're trying to solve things you're trying to do because everybody's got their, their equity plans out there. Uh, but we've got a lot of tools, resources, and, and folks we can tap into that can bring to bear some really cool solutions by broadening that conversation. So I think first of all is, is reaching out and say, hey, we're, we're working on this. Uh, chances are there's somebody else out there. And the one position that the GSA has is we see across multiple agencies of who's working on what, who's got what, who's solved something and who has it kind of thing. And so we can, we can help you with those kind of conversations. And then also uh, we're starting to gather a lot of information as, as Andrea noted, the RFI that we are, or the uh, uh, survey we have out for DEI in the industry, what's going on right now. So we know the level of uptake that we can at least get a sense of. Uh, we're also doing other initiatives on some universal design practices and things like that that we can share. So the more we can keep the communication lines open with the challenges that are in front of you, uh, 
come to us and we can help you out. And even if you're at a starting point where you, I don't even know where to start, give us a call. We'll be glad to sit down with you and, and work with you to develop some kind of strategies and plans around it. I, I want to caution against just throwing out these, these broad brush. Here's what you can do kind of thing. Go, go do these three things. You'll be great kind of thing. I really like to contextualize answers, not only to the culture of your organization, but to the problems you're trying to solve. Yep. And um, as Kay, as you mentioned, uh, bringing private sector into this conversation is, is fundamental uh, to how we uh, can make sure we're solving the right problems as government and that these are um, actionable and um, reasonable for industry yeah. to operate. Yeah, I think so. Yeah. Okay. Well, uh, any just last thoughts? Uh, we've got a, a couple minutes left, but um, I think it's been a really thoughtful, robust conversation, and hopefully the audience is... Uh, it, you all are getting some praise in the chat here. So, uh, uh, so I think we've done our job uh, in terms of laying out the set of uh, uh, challenges and helping folks think through these in a, in a, in a, in a way that actually makes a difference. Um, any, any last thoughts as we just kind of close out? I'll, I'll throw down a gauntlet. Okay. <laughs> so, so I believe that we are at a time where the entire world is asking, what is the future of work, workplace, workforce? We have a unique opportunity. We need to go big. We need to stop nickel and diming this and taking this one at a time. In, in all of our research, we've identified 10 different cohorts or groups of individuals that we believe are underserved. And if we truly want people to be able to bring their full selves to work and to be able to tap into the best, we need to think about racial, gender, sexual orientation, ethnicity, social, economic, age, physical ability, mental health, cognitive and neural ability and religious preferences. We need to start thinking much, much broader because American with Disabilities Act got us to where we are today 30 years ago. And because somebody and the industry came together, they didn't compete against each other. They came together to say, this is important and we need to address this. We need to look at all those different 10 groups, co cohorts, characteristics, and to start identifying a broader framework because we can't tackle these one at a time. It'll take us 300 years. We don't have that. We have a unique opportunity right now to really truly think, how are we truly embracing the notion of diversity, equity, and inclusivity? And, and the, the last thing I'll say is diversity is about uh, making, you know, counting people. Inclusivity is about making people count. We want people to count. Awesome. Beautifully wow. said, Hey. Yes. <laughs> yes. Um, and I that was a mic drop. That was a mic yes, drop. And I think we, we are drop. happy to end on that and uh, uh, bring in uh, uh, back to the PBS team for just some, some final thoughts to close out this session. Thank you so much for, uh, for your candor and your passion and the work that you're doing and your expertise. And we look forward to continuing uh, the partnership to drive more equity and accessibility in our built environment. So thank you all uh, again for the lovely conversation. Thank you. All thank right. You. Thank you, Andrea. And thank you to our entire panel for that really important discussion. I will just take the last couple of minutes to thank you for your attendance. And, and now we will turn the mic over to our assistant commissioner of the Office of Portfolio Management, Stuart Burns, for a few closing remarks for the 2022 PBS Customer Forum. Thank you. Great, thank you for that. And uh, I, I do feel a little bit guilty picking up the mic after that mic drop because that was a, a perfect ending to that segment. Um, this does bring us to the conclusion of this year's uh, PBS Customer Forum. And I wanna take a moment to thank uh, both all of our speakers and presenters that have been here over the past three days and our panelists. I wanna thank the team that puts this on, PBS team that puts this on behind the scenes, specifically Tiffany Simon, who's our program manager for this every year. Uh, Andrea Bell, Eric Fulton, Matt Robinson, Melanie Abrams, Kelly Morrison, Toby Slaughter, Chad Seitz, and Shea Badageshin, who's our executive sponsor. Um, and I'm, most importantly, I want to thank all of you for attending. I know it's a, it's a difficult thing to block out several hours over consecutive days, um, not to mention that many of us are, are suffering from extreme Zoom fatigue, but it's really important, I think, for us to come together as industry colleagues for events like this and, and share our perspectives. Uh, I think we heard a lot of valuable information this week. There's much of many things to reflect on here. Um, and as we collectively move forward in planning our future workplaces or to help the administration achieve its very ambitious goals, 
I want to reiterate PBS's commitment to collaborating and partnering with each of your organizations. You can always reach out to our national customer lead for assistance and advice. Uh, once again, on behalf of Public Building Service, I want to thank you for attending this year's customer forum. Um, and we look forward to seeing you next year. Take care, everybody.